It's bigger, it's better, but is it better? Ford was really hoping to make a big splash with its all-new 1971 Mustang. Uh, Ford actually used the earlier cars in its sales literature, recalling the memory of how the 1964 and a half Mustang was the most popular car launch ever, and that they created a whole new market segment with the Mustang. And while those early cars sold like crazy, by 71, uh, the sales were sliding on Mustangs. So Ford was kind of hoping that by redesigning the car and injecting some new excitement into it, they would try and boost sales. And there's one theory that says the 71 Mustang grew in size because the young people that bought these cars back in 64 and 5 now were six or seven years more mature and they might be married and have kids and they're starting a family that no longer fits in a small Mustang. So they decided to make the Mustang bigger with a little bit more of a back seat to attract those first time buyers to come back and buy another one. In the actual Ford brochure for the 71 Mustang, it says, remember how the original Mustang set the pace and how it captured the hearts of sports car aficionados? Well, now they're trying to use that memory to sell the new car for 71. The 71 Mustang was an all new design. And a lot of people thought this was the first Mustang that didn't look like a Mustang. The hood got real long, the roof line changed, this rear window is almost flat, and the deck lid basically disappeared. And Ford tried to say this was a sporty personal car with European flair, but a lot of Mustang fans just thought it was just too big. These cars seem to be kind of polarizing with their style. People either love them or hate them, and there's really a lot to look at on this bigger Mach 1 for 71. Some of the things that I find most interesting are not only the sloping rear fastback design, which they actually called a flat back in one of the brochures. But if you look closely, there's some aerodynamic tricks going on. They smoothed out the door handles and made them flush. Uh, they hid the windshield wipers below the hood. And take a look at that front bumper. On the Mach 1, it's body colored, and it's actually designed to look like a spoiler and not just a bumper. So it has a very sharp leading edge. In the middle, there's a little relief that kind of leads up to the contour line in the hood between the hood scoops. It's a very, very interesting design. And of course, our Mach 1 has an actual spoiler down below. So the front of this car is all business. Other aggressive styling points on the Mach 1 are the full length black stripe that comes up the fender and runs down the side and ends at the back of the car. The bottom of the car is color keyed black. The rear wing is blacked out as is the taillight panel which matches that blacked out section of the hood. And our car has the Ram Air option, which makes those hood scoops functional. It's also got a very interesting color. It's called pewter. It's not quite silver and it's not quite gray, but it really makes those stripes stand out. The 429 Ram Air V8 was a great motor, made a lot of power and a ton of torque. But this is one of the only times where the big block engine got embarrassed by its little brother. Uh, if you look it up, I believe the 351 was actually faster than the 429. My theory is that this thing made so much torque and the tire technology just didn't stand a chance. So it went up in smoke while the other car just took off. Now, before we get a ton of feedback saying how there's no way the Boss 351 was faster than the 429 Cobra Jet, uh, consider this, that Motor Trend Magazine was able to run a Boss 351 car in the quarter mile of 13.8, which was pretty fast, uh, considering that most of the magazines were getting 14.0s and 14.2s out of the 429 car. Again, there's no doubt in my mind that with the right tune and the right tire, the 429 Cobra Jet would certainly put a Boss 351 in the rearview mirror, but it wasn't a given. The secret sauce of the 429 was an 11.3 to 1 compression ratio. Uh, with the Ram Air, this thing made 375 horsepower at about 5,400 RPM, 450 foot-pounds of torque at just 3,400 RPM, but it still had a hydraulic cam, so it was mild-mannered on the street. It breathed through a Holley carburetor and had free-flowing exhaust. The Cobra Jet cars also incorporated a set of coolers, an oil cooler, a transmission cooler, 
This one is a C6 automatic car. This one also has the drag pack, which means it's got a traction lock, Y-code, 411 to one rear gear and back on a non-slip differential. So it was designed to hook up right off the line. The reason you don't see very many of these cars is, quite frankly, they didn't make that many of them. If you're looking at the true J-Code 429 Super Cobra Jet, uh, they made 554 total, but only 167 were Mach 1s with the automatic. This car is rolling on 15 by 7 Magnum 500 wheels with Goodyear raised white letter F60 15 tires, which are very similar to what this would have come with new. And Ford literature suggested that the bigger overall size and wider stance equated to better handling characteristics. The Mach 1 styling continues inside the car. You have a set of high back bucket seats with a vertical stripe. Earlier ones had horizontal stripes in the upholstery. In the interior in this car is a contrasting saddle color, which is an interesting combination against the pewter exterior paint. The dashboard is loaded with a clock, a fuel gauge mounted high in center, and a 120 mile an hour speedometer. And at the top of the center console, you'll find the oil pressure, alternator, and temp gauge. But one thing that's curiously missing is a tachometer. So this new Mach 1 design was pretty controversial back in 71. But what do you think? Would you roll a car like this? Let us know on our Facebook page or the YouTube comments. And stay tuned because we've got more great muscle cars from the Brothers Collection next time on Muscle Car of the Week.